Hey YouTube, it's Guy. Today on the review table I have another field watch. If you've been watching my channel for the past year, you're probably already well aware that field watches are one of my favorite styles or genres of watch design. On a couple of occasions I've already reviewed some, uh, including the Hamilton, uh, Hamilton Khaki Field, as well as one of my first videos, the Seiko SNK-809. Now, the SNK-809 is a Seiko 5, just like the watch that we have on the table today, which is the Seiko SNG, SNZG-13. Now, a lot of people probably argue that the Seiko 5 SNK-809 that was previously reviewed is not necessarily a field watch, and yeah, you could make that argument. I mean, the dial design and layout is very reminiscent of a pilot's watch or a Flieger watch. I would say that there's an exception to that, though, in that the overall sizing of that watch is not uh, indicative of a traditional pilot's watch. It's a very small watch. I believe it was 37 millimeters. Now, if this watch that's on the table had that dial, it would be a much more appropriate pilot's watch, uh, in my opinion, because this watch is quite a bit bigger than that SNK 809. Now, uh, I did like the 809 quite a bit, um, as is evident in the previous review, but if I'm going to be completely honest with you guys, I prefer this SNZG 13 a bit more. Now, first things first, the SNZG series of watches comes in a bunch of different models. This is, again, the 13. Uh, there is the SNZG 15, which comes on a uh, canvas uh, cloth strap as opposed to the metal bracelet that we see on this watch. And then there's a number of different models that also give you different colored dials and strap options. But the one that I preferred the most was the one on the metal bracelet, the SNZG 13. So that's what we have here on the table today for review. I would say that for the money, People are going to wonder, they're going to say like, well, you know, this is, uh, first First things first, this is a roughly $110 to $130 watch, maybe slightly cheaper if you find it on sale. That other Seiko, the SNK 809, which is hugely popular, is like half the price. And people are going to say like, is this one twice as good as that watch? Mm, I mean, it, it's really going to boil down to how you feel about the sizing, mostly, and then secondarily, the design of the layout and the legibility of the watch. I find that this watch has got a much more aesthetically pleasing dial layout. But that's just me. You know, you, you might completely have a different opinion on that, and that's fine. But for me, I guess the answer to that question is, is this one a better watch than that SNK 809? Uh, I wouldn't call it better, but I would say that I prefer it. And I would go ahead and leave it at that. Now, on the table here, we have the Seiko box. Uh, here's the model information on the sticker uh, SNZG13 over here on the sticker side. Uh, it's, it's your typical Seiko box. It's their blue box and the white slipcase. Pull the slipcase off. Um, pop the box open. There's the little Seiko pillow that the watch is strapped down to and the manual and everything is in there. That's really all there is to show. N nothing special here. This is a very typical uh, presentation uh, for your Seiko 5 uh, more affordable Seiko watches. So we'll go ahead and get that off the table. It's not really all that important to show you that much more. And we will dive in here and talk directly about this watch again, the SNZG 13. So we'll cover the basic specifications of this watch first and then I'll, I'll give you guys my opinions and impressions of the quality of the design, the features, and the functionality of this watch, which is basically the format that I use in most of my videos. Number one, this is a steel case with a metal bracelet. Uh, the bracelet is uh, got a deployant, uh, push button deployant with a fold over safety clasp. Very typical uh, Seiko bracelet on here. Uh, we do have a screw-in see-through exhibition case back, which I'll look at a little bit more closely here later on. And we uh, have, of course, Seiko's Hardlex crystal covering the dial. Again, all standard fare. Over at the 3 o'clock position, we have a day and date complication, which is universally 
present, I think, on every single Seiko 5 model, if I'm not mistaken. We do get 100 meter water resist, however the crown is not screwed down, and as you know from all, probably all of my previous videos, I treat all water resistant ratings skeptically, particularly if it doesn't have a screw down crown, uh, but advertised 100 meter water resistance. We do have Luma Bright Luminescence on the handset and the hour markers, but not the numerals, and I'll talk about that more later as well. As far as measurements on this watch, now I did say in the beginning of the introduction that this is often compared to the Seiko SNK 809, with one of the two big differences being the dimensions of the watch. Now the 809 was a 37 millimeter watch. This watch here is quite a bit bigger. We have a 42 millimeter diameter on the case here. We have 22 millimeter lugs. The overall thickness is not bad. It's only 12 millimeters thick and it, it wears, you know, low to the wrist very well. I mean, it's, it's I think, just the right thickness for, for a typical mechanical or automatic watch. Now, the interesting dimension here is lug to lug. So from the top lug to the bottom lug, 49 millimeters overall. And if we look at the lugs on this watch, they are much more elongated and pronounced than you find on typical Seiko watches. One of the reasons why a Seiko watch typically wears small, in people's opinions, and I don't see this articulated very often, is because the overall lug-to-lug -lug dimensions tend to be a little short. They, they generally have short, stubby little lugs. This watch uh, de deviates from that general design in that the overall lugs are a little bit bigger, a little bit more pronounced, and a little bit more elongated. What that means is that this watch does wear big. It's a 42, mil 42 millimeter diameter case, and it wears like a 42 millimeter diameter case. If you take, it, for example, the super, super popular dive watch, the SKX 007 or 009, that watch wears small in most people's opinions. And it's because it has the very traditional overall short lug width, lug to lug width, that Seiko is, in my opinion, known for at least in their more affordable Seiko 5 and uh, more budget-priced standard Seiko watches. Again, this watch does have a much longer overall lug-to-lug -lug width, and again, it makes this watch wear a little bit big. Now, the last thing to talk about in the specifications is the movement. This watch runs on the Seiko 7S36 automatic movement. We'll go ahead and talk about that movement a little bit here before we move on to uh, all of the... Uh, designs and features and functionality. Uh, again, it's the 7S36 movement, which is a 23 joule movement. If we look down at the very bottom of the dial to the left of the 6, you can see maybe it says 7S36 there. Uh, it's, it's very, very small uh, printing. Now, m a lot of Seiko 5 watches come with the 7S26, which is a 21 joule movement. Again, this is the 7S36, and it's a 23 joule movement. My research has basically more or less come to the conclusion that the differences between the 7S36 and the 7S26 are, for all intents and purposes, non-existent, negligible, almost meaningless. Those two extra jewels, most people seem to think that it doesn't really do anything. It doesn't add to the accuracy. It doesn't add to the power reserve. It probably was nothing more than marketing to dress up the movement and make it seem though as if it is a little bit higher end than the 21 joule version. Uh, so specifications, other than the fact that there's two extra joules in this movement, are going to be virtually identical. You have an automatic bi-directional winding movement that beats at 21,600 vibrations or beats per hour. You get a 40 hour power reserve. Now since this is bi bi-directional winding movement, it should, we should also note that it does not hand wind and it does not hack, meaning you can't spin the crown to wind the movement's uh, mainspring to give it power. And pulling the crown out does not stop the watch from running, it doesn't halt the second hand uh, very, very typical, almost all Seiko 5s that have the 7S series of movement movements, be it the 7S26 or the 7S36, they don't hand wind and they don't hack. Um, but what we mean by the bi-directional winding is that if we look at the back here, on, on the case back you can see that there's a little rotor, and as I spin the watch, that rotor spins. Gravity is obviously 
pulling it down. That rotor can spin in either direction while it's on your wrist and by getting that rotor to spin around that is how we wind up the watch and achieve a 40 hour power reserve ultimately. So in either direction that rotor can spin around and uh, power your watch. Now accuracy I assume again since the I can't find a lot of information specifically on the 7S36, but all of the accuracy information about the 7S26 is out there and available. And again, most people believe that for all intents and purposes, they're identical. So accuracy on this watch is advertised based on the movement to be between minus 20 seconds per day and as much as plus 40 seconds per day. Not particularly impressive. Uh, most people be it any of the Seiko 5 watches, are reporting much better accuracy than that. And I've never had a Seiko 5 that has run 20 seconds per day slow or as much as 40 seconds per day fast. But, you know, plus 10, plus 15 seconds per day, minus 10, minus 15 seconds per day, yeah, that's super common. My point is that if your goal is to get an extremely accurate watch out of the box, you're dealing with luck of the draw. You're gambling a little bit when it comes to these more inexpensive Seiko 5 watches. Very unlikely that you're going to get Kosk st style accuracy, which would be no more than minus four to plus six seconds per day. Very unlikely that you're going to get that kind of accuracy on any given example. It's certainly possible. You could buy one and it could be extremely accurate. But, you know, that's not really in the realm of realistic expectations. That said, finding one that runs 10 or 15 seconds per day or maybe you know a little bit better that's very common that's been my experience for the most part and I've owned several Seiko 5 watches um, but you know that is what it is now another issue with the movement the 7s series of movements is that they have very poor positional accuracy now I if you've seen my previous video I, I do own a multifunction time grapher and I've reviewed it and if you set the watch on the time grapher with the dial facing up, you'll get a reading. I don't remember what this one read exactly. It's been a while since I've tested it, but let's just say dial up, you get a reading of plus 10 seconds per day. And then you change it to crown up. You're going to get a very, likely, you're going to get a very different reading, maybe minus 7 seconds. So you'd be plus 10 in this position, minus 7 in this position. With the dial facing down, maybe you're going to get an accuracy of uh, plus 15, plus 20, plus 30. But all of those different positions are going to be wildly different. And what's really going to matter is how does it perform based on your wearing habits. You know, if you wear this watch 12, 14, 16 hours per day, uh, it's not sitting in one position. It's moving all over the place with your wrist and as it moves It's going to be keeping different times and different positions and at the end of the day Over the course of many many days or weeks even you, you can test and see what kind of accuracy you're getting and get a good idea of what you Can expect now the reason that I'm bringing this up is that from that point once you have an idea of what you're getting you could have this watch regulated and it's very simple to regulate these watches if we uh, look at the movement let me see if I can get a picture you can see right there on the balance wheel there's a plus and a minus let me try to get the rotor out of the way a bit and there's two little levers you can adjust those levers to make the watch go faster or slower and once you have an idea of the kind of accuracy that you're getting on the wrist on a daily or weekly basis, you can make minor adjustments to those levers to achieve better regulation. So while this watch is not going to be very likely not going to be very inherently accurate out of the watch or out of the box, I'm sorry. And even though it does have poor positional accuracy, all 7S series movements do, you can still, after getting a sense of letting it break in and getting a, you know, let it break in and get a sense of what kind of accuracy you're getting, you can make or have a watchmaker make some minor adjustments to it and get it to run a little bit better. So I guess that's the silver lining is these are inexpensive watches that have relatively robust movements that are reliable and long lasting and they're easy to regulate. So that's one reason why I like the 7S series of movements. I do, of course, wish that it had features like hand winding and hacking, but we have to move up to Seiko's 4R series of movements to get those functionality uh, functions, I guess. So moving along, I mean, that's basically everything you need to know about the movement. Um, 
pretty boring stuff. Let's talk about quality, design, features, functionality. Overall, the quality of this watch is pretty good, particularly when we're talking about a $100 wristwatch. The the overall fit and finish, I mean, it's not bad. If we take a close look at the case here, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to zoom the camera in so I'm not moving back and forth. Uh, I'm going to zoom the camera in here so we can get some really close shots of uh, the different parts of this watch, all right? All right, so if we take a look at, the, again, the case on this watch, we have brushed surfaces on the top, both on the top of the bezel and the top of the case. And the brushing, it's okay. It's not great. You know, it's not not it's not super high quality brushing. You can see the probably here on, on this area. You can see all that like texture. It's not super, super smooth. It's not satiny flat finish. It's clearly a high production manufacturing process of, of, of brushing. But that, you know, like I said, it's not bad. It's same thing with the bezel. You know, it's it's got okay brushing. Um, the sides are polished, and interesting, the side of the case and the side edge of the bezel here are both polished. And the polishing, again, is not outstanding. It's okay. Uh, there's lots of smudges on here. I got a little cloth. Let's see if I can wipe this off and give you a better idea of what that polishing really looks like. It's not high gloss mirror polished, but it's decent, you know, it's what you would expect at this price point, maybe even what you could expect at a little bit higher of a price point, if I'm being honest. And that's on both sides of the cases. You have um, a, a, a mild polishing, we'll call it, not high polish, but a mild polishing, as well as on the fa uh, face of the crown here, you have polishing. Now, the, the bracelet has also got this brushed finish, and it's that same kind of streaky brush pattern. It's not super satiny smooth, but it's not bad. The sides of the links on the bracelet also are kind of polished, but again, not super high polished, not not like glow-in-the-dark crazy polished. But again, it's, it's decent. It's okay. There's nothing that I'm going to complain about as far as that's concerned at this price point. I did have a little bit of a scuff mark on one of the lugs, yeah, it's this lug here. I don't know if that's picking up on camera too well, but right up in this region, there's a little bit of a scuff mark. It came that way. So probably when it was being assembled, when the bracelet was putting on, being put on, whoever was doing that process pr probably scuffed up the lugs. So, you know, you're going to deal with some quality control issues when it comes to Seiko watches, and the least of which is going to be the, the finishing of the case, if I'm being honest. Quality control issues are abound with Seiko watches. Most commonly, and this watch exhibits it, your bezel, or if, if you have a like a dive watch with a um, unidirectional bezel, or sometimes your chapter ring are going to be misaligned. On this watch here, if you look down at the 6, you see the big hash mark below the six on the chapter ring. It's not perfectly lined up, which it's harder to tell on the top at the triangle at the 12, but it, it's falling a little bit to the left, and the hash mark below the six is falling a little bit to the right. The, the bezel, or I'm sorry, the chapter ring is not perfectly lined up on this watch. Other issues that are very common are that the handset does not align perfectly on the hours. So let me show you. Let's say we, let's go to like six. That will probably make it easy to see. So we're gonna put this watch at six o'clock on the nose. And you see my hour hand, it's a little past the six. Not a ton, but it's not perfect. It's not perfectly on the six. I have the minute hand perfectly on the 12. And my hour hand is a little past six. If I back up the minute hand about seven minutes or so, my hour hand is perfectly on the six. So the hour hand is running about seven minutes fast. That doesn't mean that the watch is running seven minutes fast. It just means that the hour hand is not aligned perfectly. So when it's exactly six o'clock, the hour hand is going to be pointing just past the six. It's not a big deal. You can still read the watch perfectly. And if you're not zoomed in like this, it's hard to even notice. 
Um, but that's another quality control issue that is quite common with these more inexpensive Seiko watches. Alignment issues, alignment of the chapter ring, alignment of the handset, um, the date and day window. People will often, and I've never seen this on any of mine, luckily, but people will often say that their day and date windows aren't aligned perfectly. Like, instead of the 30 being nice and square in the middle, it might be a little high or a little low. Tuesday might be a little high or a little low. Uh, I, I don't have that problem with any of my Seiko watches, but it's another common quality control issue that you're going to find in Seiko watches. It's one of my biggest complaints with the company. I love Seiko. I, th I think they make some of the coolest watches at all sorts of different price points. It's difficult to beat what they're offering. However, their quality control is, I don't know, short of being horrible. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, I don't want to say it's horrible. It's not horrible. It's, it's not good though. Uh, just my opinion and, and a lot of people's opinions. Anyway, moving on to, you know, talking about the quality and design of this watch. We talked about the case. Again, as I mentioned, th these lugs, they're very long, which is going to make this watch when it's on your wrist feel a bit big because it is a big watch. Again, we, we're talking about a 42 millimeter diameter case with these long overall lug widths. Um, this watch is going to wear big. If you have a very small wrist, you might find it to be a bit of a problem. I have a roughly 7 inch wrist, and I'll give you guys a wrist shot on this watch in a little while. I don't have an issue with it, but I wish it was a little bit smaller if I'm being honest. I think it would look better. The crown on this, again, is not a screw down crown. It's very basic. It doesn't have any sort of uh, logo or signature or anything. It's just uh, polished on the face and uh, it's got some knurling. It is small. I like that. I, I prefer my crowns to be small. By comparison, the Hamilton watch that I'm currently wearing, that has a very large crown. Uh, I mean, it's it's not like it's a problem. It's not an interference or anything. It just throws off the design, in my opinion. I don't think that it's appropriately sized. I think that the crown on this watch is sized just about perfectly. Maybe it's a little too small. But it's, I don't know, I like it. I, honestly, I think it's just right. I like the crown, with the exception that it doesn't, it's not screw down. And <laughs> with the exception that you can't hand wind the movement by spinning it. But, you know, it is what it is. On the back, we do, again, have the exhibition case back. Um, there's nothing special, nothing super attractive about this movement. You can see the rotor. It is engraved with Seiko 7S36, 23 jewels. Uh, but yeah, there's nothing particularly impressive about this movement that really justifies the need for a transparent case back. Uh, but it is there. It is what it is. So, you know, that's what we get. I would imagine that this crystal on this is also Seiko's Hardlex crystal, but I'm not sure. It might just be a plain mineral crystal. Either way... You know, if you want to, like, take the watch off and just look at the balance wheel spinning around there, or look at the rotor rotating as you spin the watch around. Maybe you want to impress some friends that have never seen a mechanical watch. You know, hey, check this out. You know, that's, that is what it is. Uh, again, the main crystal on the dial here is a hard Lex crystal that's Seiko's proprietary crystal material. Uh, supposedly, it's better than standard mineral crystal. I have never had any issues with any crystals on any of my watches. Uh, but, you know, basically, I guess what that means is there's nothing wrong with this crystal in my experience. The crystal is covering this, what I think is a very attractive field watch styled dial. The, the dial has a couple of layers to it. And if we get in real close here, you have the outer chapter ring, which is raised, and then set down below is the the dial with all of the numerals and, and everything. I, I, I think that that's a very nice design aesthetic. I like it quite a bit. I like when my dials have some depth and dimension like this. Uh, it, it just adds a visual point of interest, in my opinion. It looks cool. Now, the dial itself, of course, we have the Seiko 5 logo. The 5 shield is applied... I believe the Seiko logo is applied too, but it's very small. It's hard to see. Below that, it says sports for Seiko 5 sports. That's The sports is just printed. And then on the bottom, 
lower side of the dial, you have automatic 23 joules, 100 meter, and that's just printed on the dial. The numerals are Arabics 1 through 12, with the exception of the 3 o'clock numeral, because that's where the day and date window is. And then you also have military uh, Arabic numerals 13 through 24, again, with uh, the exception of there being a 15 at the 3 position. One problem with this watch is, while it does have Seiko's Lumabright Luminescence on the handset, and on the main markers on the chapter ring, so the main hour markers on the chapter ring, the numerals are not uh, loomed at all. So I'll, I'll try to roll in a picture or a little video of the loom, but basically you, you don't see the numbers at all in the dark. You just see the hands and you see the, hash, the big main hash marks on the chapter ring and that's it. That's a little bit of a downside. I would like it better had the at least the main 1 through 12 numerals been loomed as well. But, you know, it is what it is. They're not. So, uh, yeah, that's one minor negative about this watch. The uh, the day and the date, you know, it's a, black, it's a black wheel with white text. It's super legible. Setting it is simple. You just pull the crown out to the first position. And it's quick set, so spinning it that direction, I guess clockwise, changes the date, and spinning it counterclockwise changes the day. Of course, every other click is, um, I don't know if that's Spanish or Portuguese, I'm not sure what language that is, I don't speak it. So every other one is a different language, but English, you know, that's where they are. And pulling the crown out to the second position allows you to change the, uh, the time. You can see as the time starts rotating, Past 10 o'clock, the date starts to swap, and it will flip at about midnight. So we're at 11.30, and right at midnight, or just before, it flips. Now the day is starting to flip, and that takes a few hours. At 1 o'clock, roughly, quarter to 1, it switches to the secondary language, and then by about, I think, 3 o'clock, 2.30, 3, something like that, yeah, it's swapped at, right at 3 o'clock to your, the primary language, English in this case. Um, it's the way that all Seiko watches work. They, they transition day and date pretty slowly over the course of several hours at night. So long as you have the date set, day and date correctly set for, well, I guess the time technically correctly set for AM and PM, it shouldn't be something that you notice because, it, again, it happens at midnight to 3 a.m. in that time range. Uh, the handset themselves, it's, it's okay. They're kind of like fence post style hands. And if we look really close, you can see the loom material on the center of the hour and the minute hands. And then the second hand is tipped with a nice red kind of arrow, almost needle like point. And there's a little tiny bit of loom there in the middle of that red tip. They're not the most attractive hands in the world, but they're super functional and, you know, they're, they're good for a field watch aesthetic, I guess. You know, if we take a look again at my Hamilton watch, I think that the handset on that watch is much more attractive. Um, but, you know, this watch is four times, maybe almost five times the price. Uh, but, I, you know, just I just prefer the handset on this Hamilton watch a bit better than the very plain fence post style hands of this Seiko watch. That said, again, they're legible, they're functional, it's... It's fine. They work. Uh, probably the last thing to talk about when we're talking about features and the design of this watch is the bracelet. The bracelet's pretty nice. Uh, you do have hollow end links, and we'll take a quick look there. The end links are hollow, but I don't have a problem with hollow end links so long as they're not uh, rubbish, <laughs> for lack of a better word. You know, as long as they're decent end links and they're not squeaky and rattly, I don't have a problem with it. That said, these end links are a little bit rattly. I don't know if I can get it. They're, they're not bad. If, if, if you hold the, the watch tight and kind of shake it a little bit, there's a little bit of play. Not much. It, you can't even really hear it. So it's not an issue. I have had end links on some, hollow end links on some watches where it's like, they just shake and rattle and move around. You know what I mean? They're not, they're not snug, snugly fit to the watch case. So while these are hollow end links, um, no problem with them, and you know I think they work just fine. The actual links, I mean, there is kind of like a seam on them. I don't know if I can get it to show on the camera. 
So I'm not sure exactly what's, you know, are these like solid, solid bracelet links? I don't know if you see there's that seam there going down the middle, right on the edge of each link. Uh, but they feel good, they feel solid. The, again, the brushing on each of these links is not bad. There is a slight bit of taper up here at the uh, lug area. It's a little bit wider, and it tapers just a little bit down towards the buckle end. It's, it's not very extreme. If you saw my Rolex Explorer video, that was one of the things I disliked a lot about that watch was how much taper there was. The Rolex was 20 millimeters up at the lugs, whereas this is 22. But the Rolex tapered down all the way to 15 millimeters at the buckle end, and I just thought that that was too much. This one, again, it does have a tiny, very subtle little bit of taper, but it's not extreme. It works just fine, in my opinion. Uh, resizing this bracelet's super simple. It's standard. It uses uh, friction pins that you just punch out. There's n no need for any sort of screwdriver. They don't use Seiko's notorious pin and collars, so it's very simple to, to resize this bracelet. Probably the only downside about the bracelet is the clasp, and it's not awful, it's just standard Seiko clasp. Again, you have the, uh, well, it's signed Seiko, the fold-over safety clasp portion, and then once that's open, you have dual push buttons to deploy the clasp. The elbow portion of the clasp is super lightweight, stamped metal. It's, if I'm being honest, it's crappy material. There's nothing very nice about it. It's not machined, uh, but it... it it works. It, it, I could just see where if you wanted to break it, you could break it with your bare hands. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's there's not much to it. Similarly, while the the clasp or, or buckle portion, I guess, is nice enough looking, it is that same cheap stamped metal material. Uh, there's not much substance to it. Another downside. Well, I guess it's not really a downside or an upside. There are four micro adjustment holes. I prefer to have more. I, I like as many micro adjustment holes as possible. Some bracelets, like the bracelet that this Hamilton that I'm wearing, it only has two, and that sucks. I wish that this maybe had five or six, you know, make the overall buckle a little bit longer and add an extra hole or two. I'd, I'd prefer that if, uh, you know, they were asking me how should we design these buckles. Uh, but four is better than one or two, so, you know, that's a plus. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, really the only major downside about this watch is that the buckle on the bracelet is not great. The bracelet's okay. The buckle's not great, but it works. It's not like, uh, it's not going to be a problem for you. It's not like I would say, well, don't get it on the bracelet because the buckle's so bad. That's not, that's not the case at all. The buckle's not so bad. It's just not so good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but yeah, that, you know, that's basically it. So, going back to the sort of introduction, uh, this is, you know, the SNZG-13. Of course, there's a couple of other models, the 15 and different colorations as well. I don't, I don't know all the numbers. But it's a, another field watch in the Seiko 5 line. And how does it compare to that ultra-popular SNK-809? Favorably. I mean, I think it's a better designed watch. I don't think it's a better quality watch. I think they're probably equal in quality, which is to say that they're okay quality for the price. Uh, but overall, I just like the design and the aesthetic better, you know, for me. Your, your mileage may vary. I'll go ahead and throw it on my wrist for you guys so that you can see what it looks like on my roughly 7-inch wrist. You can look at the the Hamilton khaki field there for a few seconds if you want. <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's go ahead and Try this on for you, give you a look at the watch on my wrist. I'm going to go ahead and zoom the camera out so that you can see it a little bit better. And uh, yeah, give you that wrist shot. So there it is, guys. There is the Seiko 5 SNZG13 on my roughly 7-inch wrist. It fits pretty good. I probably... Eh, I might have it a little bit too loose. I could probably tighten up that micro-adjustment one notch. Um, but it, it fits good. Uh, I like the bracelet again, again, that it doesn't have a ton of taper. Uh, you know, it comes at 22 millimeters on the, on the lugs and, and just a hair of taper down to the buckle side. Uh, the watch itself, again, that 42 millimeter diameter case with those especially long overall lug width uh, from top to bottom, lug to lug, 
it wears big, you know? It, 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 let's zoom out a little bit more here. Maybe that'll give you a better look. Uh, is it too big? You know, not for me, uh, but it is big. Uh, by comparison, I guess, let me slide my Hamilton, which is a 38 millimeter, next to it. Uh, so we have a 38 millimeter Hamilton here with the 42 millimeter uh, Seiko next to it. Of course, that Hamilton's not on my wrist. It's just kind of on my hand there. But just to give you a, an idea of how much bigger it is over a 38 millimeter watch, you know, it's, it is. It's big. Not going to lie. That said, it, it wears fine for me. Um, and, I, and I suspect unless you had a, a less than six and a half inch wrist, it probably would wear fine for, for just about anybody. But it could be a little smaller, you know, if 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 I had my way, I would I would shrink it down just a touch. But it's a nice watch, particularly at around the hundred hundred twenty five dollar price point. Can you beat it? I mean, do you if you if you want a field watch? I did review the Timex Expedition. That's a quartz powered watch. It's much much lower quality than this watch, but you know you could beat it. It's very similar in style and aesthetic. So, you know, maybe that's an option if you wanted to get something at maybe, you know, $30 or $40 price point that it is a little bit smaller, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I would probably pony up and spend the extra money unless the size is a super, super big problem for you. And then in that case, maybe you consider that Sago SNK 809. The 809 is a nice little watch, too. It's just, uh, in my opinion, that watch is just a little too small. And I prefer the, uh, the dial aesthetic on this on this watch a bit more. Well, guys, I appreciate you tuning in. As always, um, I love doing these videos, and I, in particular, love field watches. I might do a, a comparison video of the Hamilton and the SNZG15. I'll zoom in a little bit closer here for my outro. So yeah, maybe I'll do a uh, little comparison video in the future of these two watches since they're... Uh, you know, filling the same role, the same niche, niche, whatever. Uh, of course, there's a not insignificant deviation in price between the two watches, but um, I like doing comparisons like that. Oftentimes, for me, I'm not looking to figure out which of two similarly priced watches I want to buy, but which of two similarly look, similar looking watches that I want to buy that usually have pretty drastically different prices. That's the way that I am challenged on a regular basis when I'm shopping. There's very often not uh, another option at the same price point. You know, if, I'm, if I wanted to get a field watch, it's not like, oh, here's these two watches that are priced the same but designed a little bit differently. It's often, here are these two similar watches that are priced significantly differently. So I don't know if you guys like those type of videos, let me know down in the notes and uh, I'll do another comparison style video of these two watches. Um, you know, closing thoughts on this guy. It's, it's a good watch. I think, again, it's a hair on the large size, but unless you have a very small wrist, like six and a quarter, six inch, six and a quarter, something like that, you know, anything over six and a half. And I think you're going to be fine. I think you can wear this watch. No problems. Uh, quality, you know, it's, it, it's a hundred dollar watch. You get what you pay for. I think it's very decent quality. And I think for the price, you probably aren't going to do much better. You know, again, you could do a little bit cheaper. You can go for like at the Timex route. Uh, but if you want a nice field watch, this is probably the best bang for your buck. Notwithstanding that SNK 809, which again is very drastically different in design in certain regards, size and dial layout and whatnot. Anyway, I'm going to sign off here. I appreciate you tuning in. I appreciate you sticking around to the end. If you did, tell me down in the comments if you watch my entire videos. I've had people complain, my videos are too long, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I do long videos. I do thorough videos. I like to create a definitive source of, source of information on the things that I review. So you're not going to get five and 10 minute videos out of me very often. You know, 20 minutes, probably some of the shortest videos I do with very few exceptions. But tell me down in the comments, do you guys enjoy these long 30, 40, 45 minute long videos? Uh, or would you, do you think I'm wasting my time? I, I would be interested to hear what you guys think. 
in the notes section below this video, you'll find links to my Facebook, social media accounts, Twitter, Patreon, Instagram, blah, blah, blah. If you're interested in buying this watch, I'll put a link through my Amazon affiliate account to it. And uh, if you buy it through that link, I get a 4 or 5% commission, which helps me out, gives me money to put towards new products to review, because frankly, I'm starting to run out of products to review. <laughs> I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to keep this up. Uh, but as always, I appreciate you tuning in. I appreciate you guys being subscribers and liking and sharing these videos, and I hope that you stick around with me as the channel grows. And yeah, that's it. That's all I got for today. All right, guys, take care. Have a great one. Bye.